Good morning, uh, once again, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are you know, around the world. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, once again, we are here for a talk about Italy. Uh, what's going on here? Um, a few words of the current situation and uh, uh, the continuation of our story of our tale about uh, the history of Rome and then we will talk about the, later on in the next episodes uh, we, we, will, we will go on with the history of Italy until uh, the present days. So uh, very glad to hear that uh, uh, there are a few of you online and uh, for my American and Canadian friends uh, who now it's in the middle of the night I hope that uh, they will be able to to tune in uh, uh, later on and they will enjoy this uh, um, this uh, episode okay so this uh, this is episode five uh, we have left you uh, last time with uh, uh, the, the Caesar's death and now uh, we have two we had two new characters that were Octavian and um, Anthony and now we're going to see how it's going to end and uh, uh, how we will shift from the Republic to uh, to the Empire. Uh, anyway, um, first of all, a few words about uh, what's going on here, the current situation. And, uh, well, this is a picture of uh, the Duomo of Milan. This is, uh, uh, you can see on the left, the uh, Galleria Vittorio Emanuele. Well, that's... Uh, that's a sad picture because it, it's empty. Uh, you can see that uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, it, it's a picture probably taken in the first uh, hours of the day, but uh, the the piazza would be would be uh, taming with people going to work, and uh, it's not. This means that uh, the situation now is is not very good. To be very honest, uh, we are in in the middle of the. Uh, of the so-called second wave or third wave, as you want to call it. I don't know what's the situation over there. I, I've seen, uh, I, I'm following the situation in the States, in Canada, in Singapore, in the Far East. Well, here uh, we are having a surge in, uh, well, the surge has has already begun, has already happened in uh, in, in January and uh, beginning of February. Now it's, uh, it, it, the situation has, uh, Stabilized. The, the good news is that uh, the vaccination um, campaign is uh, is uh, is uh, on the rise. Uh, people uh, over the, um, the the people who work in the health system are uh, have been vaccinated all over Italy, and now they are starting with people over uh, the age of eighty uh, all around the country. And we hope that um, uh, it will be over. Uh, this this uh, this share of the population uh, will be vaccinated uh, very very soon uh, uh, in total, and then the plan of the new government. You know, we have a, a new government. Uh, we have been having it for for 15 days now. The plan of the new government is uh, to come and and, and to have uh, uh, people vaccinated uh, by the hundreds of thousands uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in a few days. And uh, uh, still, the the goal for for the whole European Union and for Italy too is to have uh, uh, seventy percent of the population vaccinated in, within the end of uh, of August. Uh, the bad, the the not so good news is that uh, this variant uh, is also affecting young people. So. Uh, you remember that in the first wave, uh, this was uh, primarily a, a disease, a, a pandemic affecting uh, old people. But now it's uh, ICUs uh, have been uh, going uh, more and more uh, full with uh, uh, young people, people uh, below the age of, uh, of 50 or 40. Uh, sometimes of 30. Uh, so 
the, 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 the way out of this situation is uh, nothing less than the vaccines. And there are some, uh, uh, the, 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 some uh, debates about uh, uh, what's going on with the vaccine in, uh, in Europe. So it looks like we are a little bit uh, behind the states and uh, the, 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 the UK for what concerns the vaccinations. But uh, I hope that uh, it will speed up in, in the next few weeks and uh, uh, looks like uh, vaccines will be uh, available uh, in, in uh, billions of doses uh, uh, in, uh, in three or four months. So I'm quite optimistic and uh, uh, that's why we are keeping our goal of uh, uh, keeping our, uh, opening our, up uh, our activities in uh, September 2021. Um, this picture shows uh, uh, Mrs. Liliana Segre, she's a senator of the Republic, a life senator. You know that we have five life senators who are appointed for their merits by the President of the Republic. And uh, I wanted to show you this picture, to put this picture here, because she's been, a, she, she's, uh, uh, she has been uh, inter interned into into Auschwitz uh, when she was uh, a, a little girl, a baby, and uh, she's a survivor. And uh, she stands as uh, uh, a lady who uh, has, uh, uh, who is the moral conscience of, uh, of, uh, of us all. So uh, she, she agreed to be a testimonial on vaccination to convince people to vaccinate and uh, uh, we really appreciate her effort in uh, in in in, uh, in showing uh, her participation and uh, uh, being a, a, a moral beacon for for everyone and uh, um, acting as a testimonial for for the vaccination campaign. You know that there are some debates about uh, people who are not going to be vaccinated, who do not want to be vaccinated. Uh, personally, uh, I'm looking forward to be vaccinated, and I had my 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 relatives, my dears, uh, over 80 vaccinated last week, and I'm I'm very happy about that because this this is a, a very very uh, uh, a relief for 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 us all, for 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 my family, for myself, and, and for my my dears. So um, I hope that this uh, vaccination campaign speeds up and. Uh, we are all vaccinated uh, in in very short time so that we can return to a, a life which we don't know how it will be, but we hope it will somewhat get closer to, to, to normality. Uh, and, uh, but uh, um, probably this thing is going to stay with us for, for a long time. Uh, we'll see in the next few weeks, okay? Um, okay, um, a few words about our activity. We are, as you know, we are Vitor, uh, Vitor Italy Tours. We, we just do uh, incoming tours to Italy uh, for, for small groups. And uh, uh, we have um, uh, stopped our activity uh, last, uh, last March, March 2020. And uh, now with this news, uh, we are following the news uh, day by day to see how a vaccination uh, program uh, goes on. Uh, for the time being, our plan is to resume uh, the, the, the acti our activity by September the 1st and to have uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of guided tours uh, in uh, September and October. They are already on our uh, website, www.vito.com, and uh, you will be able to, uh, we will we are not um, publishing. We are not. Uh, we are not uh, um, showing uh, prices yet because uh, we we still we are still waiting for uh, to see how the vaccination campaign goes on. And uh, um, I hope that I will be able to show it uh, our prices for for this uh, two two tours uh, in uh, in a matter of days. Uh, but uh, I will post it on uh, on Facebook. Uh, so uh, it's time for for getting back to our uh, main story about the history of Italy. Uh, let me tell you that we have a great piece of news uh, starting uh, this week. Uh, we have uh, uh, 
um, we are publishing a podcast of, of these uh, tales. Uh, um, it's not. It's going to be. Uh, there are going to be some episodes of uh, 30 minutes, more or less, and uh, we're going to 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 tell you the same, more or less, the same stories that uh, we are uh, we are telling here now. Um, so we hope that you will be. Uh, you will uh, download these episodes that we are on Spreaker, we are on uh, Apple um, Podcast, we are on Google Podcast, we are on Spotify and other major platforms. Uh, and um, I hope you, obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, audio, uh, so uh, it's not the, re the, the exact replica of what we are uh, telling here now, because here we have some images to, sh to, to show you. But uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to entertain you, and uh, we will follow. Uh, you will follow us, uh, in uh, as numerous as you are following uh, us now. Okay. Um, so uh, let's get back to our history. Uh, where were we? Well, we were at the point where um, we had the, the 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 second what is called the second uh, triumvirate. Uh, it's uh, the, the three people, the three guys uh, uh, who are sharing the power uh, in Rome are um, uh, Mark Anthony and uh, Lepidus, who are the uh, lieutenants of uh, Julius Caesar, who has been uh, killed in 44 BC, and uh, um, Octavian, Caius Octavian, uh, who is uh, the, 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 the adopted son and the nephew of uh, uh, Julius Caesar himself. So um, we have come to a point where uh, these uh, three three men have divided uh, the, the 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 possessions, uh, the dominions of uh, uh, of Rome uh, around the, the the Mediterranean into three parts, and each of them has one part. Um, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, as you can see from this map. Uh, we have the the territories of Octavian, uh, which are here. Let me let me go with the laser pointer, which is Italy and the Gladia, which is uh, conquered ten years before by by Julius Caesar and in Spain. Uh, this is Numidia, or the, what the, the province of Africa, as it was called uh, under the, the well, you, uh, Italy, uh, Gallia, and uh, Spain. Uh, are under the, 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 the rule of uh, Octavian, uh, have been assigned to Octavian. Um, Africa has been assigned to Lepidus, and uh, um, uh, Marcus, uh, Mark, Mark Anthony has taken the eastern part. In, in particular, in, uh, in the year 40, uh, Octavian and Anthony with uh, armies um, faced each other, had faced each other in, in Brindisi uh, here without clashing. And instead, they had decided to uh, renew the alliance of, a, of the triumvirate. So um, there was not any major protest by the Senate or other magistrates. So uh, as I told you, Octavian has had the Western provinces, Lepidus Africa, and Anthony uh, Greece, uh, Asia Minor, that's uh, present-day Turkey, and uh, the Middle East. And now this agreement was also sealed by uh, a marriage uh, because uh, Anthony married Octavia, uh, Octavian's sister. And um, the following year, in 39, the triumvirs made an agreement with the Sextus Pompey. Sextus Pompey was the great general's son. Uh, he had recruited a fleet of uh, exiles, proscribed, former slaves uh, and pirates, and he had occupied Sicily, Sardinia, and uh, Corsica, and uh, hindered the grain supplies from, uh, from uh, Sicily and from Egypt to Rome. Um, so, um, in exchange for renouncing uh, these uh, such piracy actions, uh, uh, Sextus Pompey was guaranteed the government of Sicilia, uh, Sicily, uh, Sardinia, Corsica, and uh, Achaia, that's the Peloponnesus here, this area here. But uh, 
This agreement was uh, was uh, short-lived. Um, Sextus Pompey uh, did not receive the, the province of Achaia, and uh, so he resumed his uh, privacy action, piracy action. And in 38, uh, before, um, the triumvirs decided to eliminate him, and this time permanently. And uh, the decisive na naval battle uh, took place in uh, 36 near Milazzo, here in Sicily. And the fleet of the Triumvirs, uh, which was led by General Marcus Agrippa, a contemporary and friend of Octavian, defeated the one uh, of Sextus Pompey, and uh, he fled uh, uh, to Asia and later was, uh, was killed here. And um, with Sextus Pompey, the last member of the factions uh, linked to the Republican system had been uh, eliminated. Uh, a few weeks later, Lepidus, who had brought his troops uh, from Africa to, to Sicily to fight against Pompey, um, he was not happy about uh, his subordinate role in, uh, in, the, in the triumvirate, and he attempted to regain a role of some weight and rebelled against uh, Octavian. But uh, Octavian was clearly too strong for, for Lepidus, and, and also Lepidus' soldiers know, knew it. So it was enough for Octavian to show up at uh, Lepidus' camp alone and unarmed as Caesar, son of Caesar. And uh, Lepidus' troops instantly passed on, on his side. Um, Lepidus had his life saved and retired to private life uh, in a splendid villa in Circeo, here close to Rome. Uh, so, having cleared the, the fleet of Sextus Pompey and having neutralized uh, uh, Lepidus also, Octavian uh, was now the absolute master of Italy and all the Western provinces. So, in November 36, uh, Octavian returned to Rome and celebrated his triumph, and the Senate granted him the inviolability for life. Until then, it was it has been it had been a, a prerogative only of the tribunes, and also the right to wear the laurel wreath as Caesar already did before him. Now, what was Mark Anthony doing in the meantime? In forty one. At the time of his first voyage uh, to the east, uh, after the victory in Philippi, he had ordered Cleopatra, you remember the charming queen of Egypt, uh, Caesar's lover, uh, to meet him in Tarsus, in Greece. And Anthony remembered her as a, as a young girl. He had met her a, a few years before in, uh, in Alexandria, but uh, he had not seen her since. And that day, Cleopatra arrived at the meeting, determined to assert all her skills as a seductress. She showed up on a ship with uh, red sails, the crew being composed of servants dressed as uh, nymphs. And she herself was, uh, was, uh, was dressed in a, in a provocative uh, uh, Venus costume. When he saw her, Anthony was stunned. Now he understood why even Caesar, who had had so many women, had been bewitched by her. And uh, Anthony could not resist her. Uh, they went together to Alexandria, and here the refinement, the luxury of the life with Cleopatra conquered him. Uh, he had been a soldier uh, all his life. And uh, Cleopatra was probably behind his decision to embark the army and confront uh, Octavian in Brindisi in, in, uh, in the year 40. And um, when Anthony returned to the East uh, in 39, he was a married man, you remember? And uh, he was married to Octavia, nothing less than Octavian's sister. And uh, regardless of this, uh, he resumed his uh, relationship with Cleopatra, with whom he began to live permanently at the court of Alexandria. And uh, moreover, he even married her. And 
The marriage between a Roman citizen and a foreigner was invalid under Roman law. In any case, it was an affront to Octavia, his legitimate wife, and uh, to Octavian himself. Uh, Octavia had remained in, uh, in Rome with their two children, and uh, she was pregnant for the, first, for the third time. Um, so it was easy for Octavian to present Anthony as uh, a man who, overwhelmed by his uh, passion for a corrupt uh, foreign woman, failed to, to in his duties as a husband and, uh, and a father. And uh, it was not the only fault in the eye of the public opinion in, in Rome. Here is a map. I want to show you something uh, uh, about the, the, this, this area here, okay? Um, in, in fact, uh, in, in 36, uh, Anthony organized a great expedition against the Parthian Empire here. The only um, powerful uh, um, entity, uh, powerful enough to, to contrast, contrast Rome. Uh, you probably remember that uh, in uh, 17 years earlier, in, uh, in 53, the Parthians had uh, annihilated uh, uh, Crassus' army in Carre. Now, taking advantage of the chaos of the civil wars, the Parthians had occupied much of Syria here and Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. And um, so, Anthony, with this expedition, he hoped to achieve a, a final definitive victory uh, against the only real opponents of Rome. Uh, and this would bring him limitless fame and popularity in, uh, in, in Italy, in, in Rome. So, the expedition was the largest ever organized by Rome. Uh, 60,000 infantrymen, 10,000 cavalrymen, another 30,000 troops provided by the kings of the kingdoms uh, of the area allied to Rome. But uh, it had started late in summer. And Anthony ran unnecessarily behind the enemy for 500 kilometers leaving behind the siege machines that uh, were intercepted and destroyed by the Parthians. And the city where the king's family lived resisted the, the, the siege, so that in autumn Anthony couldn't help but retreat. The loss of food and the continuing attacks by the Parthians turned the retreat through hostile land to, to Egypt, and without any resources, into a disaster. Uh, with the loss of uh, one-fourth of, of the troops. Despite his uh, disastrous retreat to, uh, to Egypt, in 34, Anthony was able, capable, uh, to offer himself a solemn triumph in Alexandria, scandalizing Rome. Here, he married Cleopatra, giving the whole Middle East uh, as dowry to her two sons. And uh, Caesarion, the son of her and Caesar, was proclaimed crown prince of Egypt and Cyprus. Anthony then sent a divorce order to Octavia, and thus uh, uh, he was aware he was breaking the only bond that still tied him to Octavia. Uh, Anthony now acted uh, as if the eastern provinces had been his uh, private property. It seemed that uh, he wanted to transform the rule of Rome into an, an oriental monarchy, with its capital in uh, Alexandria, here. Also, he recognized the son he had had from Cleopatra as legitimate and gave him the name of Alexander, a, a Greek, and not a Roman name, that is, the name of the great Alexander the Great, from which the Oriental kingdoms originated. Uh, attracted by the dream of an Oriental monarchy, Anthony had lost contact with Rome. The public opinion now favoring Rome now favored Octavian, who proposed himself as the defender of the genuine Roman tradition. Anthony now looked like a puppet in the hands of the beautiful, 
corrupt and corrupting queen of Egypt. Octavian was uh, uh, the, uh, a master of, uh, of communication. Uh, with a modern but uh, inappropriate term, we would say that he was uh, a master of propaganda. And it was easy for him to present Anthony as an individual who, overwhelmed by the passion for a corrupt foreign woman, uh, failed in his duties as husband as a, as a father, and uh, had allowed himself to be corrupted by the vices of the East. The East uh, was always uh, painted as a place of uh, corruption, sensuality, excesses. And Octavian had a good day, game in, in painting himself uh, uh, as the champion of pure Roman and Italic values. Then, East versus West, Italy against Egypt. And uh, by the year 32, the powers of the triumvirs, you remember in 43, where they, they were uh, nominated as triumvirs, they nominated themselves triumvirs, but uh, it lasted 10 years, and it's, it's the 32, so 10 years after 43, the powers uh, have expired, are expiring. And uh, each of the two contenders uh, are preparing for open war. But neither wanted uh, to be attributed the, the, the responsibility for, for the outbreak of hostilities. So, uh, in, in that year, Octavian appeared in the Senate, surrounded by a group of soldiers and armed friends, to defend himself against his opponent's accusations. Uh, actually, it was a coup d'etat, but carried out without violence. Octavian wanted to appear only as a political leader eager to defend his reputation. And uh, the two consuls uh, who favored Anthony helped him by leaving Rome, and uh, they left him alone on the political scene. Since then, Octavian exploited every move Anthony made to throw mud on his conduct, to present him as a traitor of Rome and even some of uh, Anthony's closest followers preferred to pass on uh, Octavian's side. The former consul Lucius Plancus revealed to Octavian not only Anthony's plans, but also the contents of his will, and uh, even who had been entrusted with it. It was an unexpected gift for Octavian. Uh, he quickly found the will, which was in position of the Vestals, the priestesses of uh, Vesta, uh, of the goddess Vesta. Uh, he seized it and uh, he took it first to the Senate and then to the People's Assembly, where he had it read. Anthony, in it, uh, solemnly stated that Caesarion was indeed Caesar's son. So, he, thus he wanted to overshadow Octavian, who was only the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And also, Anthony designated the, the sons he had from Cleopatra as his only heirs, and Cleopatra herself as regent. And finally, wherever he died, he was to be buried in Egypt. The document was uh, most likely a fail, a fake, but it served as a confirmation of all the suspicions that uh, most Romans had towards this uh, intriguing traitor and allowed Octavian to banish a war. A war that uh, he, uh, very intuitively but very perceptively, he declared not to Anthony but to Cleopatra. So the conflict was presented as if uh, it was directed against a foreign power, not as a new civil war. Anthony was portrayed as a simple traitor, uh, subject to the Queen of Egypt. And uh, the two opponents prepared for the fight. And Octavian, although not in an official position, obtained the oath of allegiance and the four funds and troops from Italy and the other western provinces. And on the other side, where, um, backing uh, Anthony, were the populations of uh, Asia Minor, Greece, Macedonia, Thrace, let's go back to the map here. Uh, okay, uh, Asia Minor, and uh, 
um, Greece, here, uh, Macedonia, here, uh, Thrace, here, here, uh, Cyrenaica, here, uh, the Egyptians, and numerous kings and princes of state uh, bordering with Roman rule in the East. Um, so Octavian's propaganda was very skillful to present the war as the clash between the Latins and the Latinized West, morally healthy, faithful gardens of tradition, um, respectful of the Republic, uh, and uh, the Greek and uh, barbarian East, refined but uh, corrupt. Here is Octavian, and uh, here is a picture of the final clash. It was a sea war. The two fleets clashed at Actium in northwestern Greece, here. Axiom is here. And on September 2nd of the year 31 BC, and Octavian's navy, led once again by Marcus Agrippa, though inferior in numbers, uh, succeeded in uh, routing uh, Anthony and Cleopatra's feet. Uh, Anthony, uh, Octavian's victory was also facilitated by the fact that uh, Cleopatra fled with uh, her naval team even before the battle was definitively lost. And Anthony followed her with uh, some ships, and it was a huge mistake because they had uh, 19 legions uh, on the ground, and uh, these 19 legions uh, were not even engaged in a battle. So Octavian did not chase the fugitives right away. He knew that uh, time worked for him and that uh, the longer Anthony stayed in Egypt, the more he burned out. He landed in Athens to restore order. Then he crossed uh, Asia to dismantle one by one all of uh, Anthony's alliances, uh, isolating him. And eventually he moved to Alexandria. And uh, on the way, he received uh, three letters. One from Cleopatra promising submission, and two from Anthony asking for peace. To him, he did not answer. To her, he let her know that uh, he would leave her on the throne if she killed her lover. When Octavian arrived in Alexandria, he locked the city. The next day, Cleopatra's mercenaries surrendered and uh, Anthony received the news that the queen had died. He believed it uh, and uh, he suicided. But uh, Cleopatra was still alive and she asked Octavian for permission to bury Anthony's corpse and to, to grant her an audience and Octavian agreed. She presented herself to him as she had done with the Caesar and Anthony. Scented, and cloaked in veils. But um, now, under those veils, there was a 40-year-old woman, not a 29-year-old girl at the top of her charm. And Octavian was much younger than her, not like Caesar or Anthony, and uh, he did not need to resort to a great strength of character to treat her coldly. He announced that he would take her to Rome and she would walk as an ornament of his chariot during his triumph. Cleopatra felt lost, and uh, this drove her to suicide. She had herself poisoned by the bite of the snake. Octavian treated the dead with a touch from which you can uh, reconstruct his character. He allowed the two corpses uh, to be buried next to each other, but um, in the meantime, to avoid any misunderstanding, he had uh, Caesarion killed, sent the sons of, uh, of the two to Octavia, his sister, who raised them as if they had been her own, and uh, proclaimed himself king of Egypt, so as not to humiliate it uh, by proclaiming it a Roman province, but also 
to make it his private property and uh, pocket is an uh, immense treasure. At that time, Octavian was just 31 and he was the only absolute heir of Caesar and the owner of the Roman state. Finally, the civil wars were over. With them, not formally but certainly in fact, also the history of the Roman Republic had come to an end. When Octavian returned to Rome in 29, laden with the riches of Egypt, he was the undisputed master of the state. His victory was total, and not only on a military level. He had won in the minds of the Romans too. In fact, after decades of civil wars, prescriptions, massacres, plots, dangers, confiscations, many were genuinely convinced that all this was the inevitable consequence of the Republican order. Peace under the power of one seemed preferable to the chaos of war and destruction, a result of the endless disputes among political factions by, led by individuals who used the Republican offices and legions as instruments of their power struggle. Romans demanded order, peace, security, good administration, a healthy currency and the protection for the goods. And Octavian set out to guarantee them. He won the favor of the soldiers with cash, the support of a populace with abundant food and the backing of all Romans with the sweetness of peace. And so he gradually began to impose himself, to merge the functions of the Senate, the magistrates, and the laws in one person, himself, and no one opposed to it. Using the Egyptian gold, he dismissed the most soldiers. Uh, the army had risen up to the total of 500,000 men. Giving veterans some land, he bought on purpose to turn them into peasants. He kept 200,000 in service and uh, he proclaimed himself emperor, a purely military title, and uh, he studied great public works. Now, he faced uh, a much more difficult task. How to consolidate this immense power? And uh, on the other hand, how to avoid the tragic end of uh, great political figures such as Pompey, Caesar, Anthony, the victims of their greatness? First of all, he should avoid a mistake that had been fatal to all of them. The history of the Roman Republic and the same deadly accusation made by the enemies to Julius Caesar, they, all this thought that uh, he should never pronounce words as king and kingdom. For over five centuries, that is, since the monarchy had been uh, abolished, uh, and the Republic established, for a Roman politician, the only suspicion of aspiring to a kingdom led to political and uh, often even physical death. The very murder of Julius Caesar taught him so. But uh, how was it possible? This was the great problem. Things needed to be changed because it was clear that the old Republic uh, was uh, now exhausted, was worn out. But uh, how was it possible to change things without switching to a fully declared uh, monarchical regime? The path followed by Octavian is a subtle and brilliant game with words. Change everything, making people believe that nothing changes. The Roman ideology was the opposite of the modern one. Contrary to change to new things, uh, a politician who made novelty his slogan would have committed suicide, and not just politically. The best of history was uh, for Romans behind them. It, it was on, on the side of the ancestors. It was mos maiorum, the customs of the ancient heroes, the golden age. Um, so even counting on the desire for peace, 
Octavian could not simply proclaim himself a king or dictator. The story of Caesar, who had been murdered on the charge of having aspired to a kingdom, was a clear sign that the Romans would not accept a real monarchy. Octavian understood this and he presented himself not as a ruler, but as the one who restore legality, restores legality and gives the power back to the Senate and to the popular assemblies after the chaos of the civil wars. He had the extraordinary ability to carry out a revolution giving the impression of restoring tradition. As Octavian himself recalls in the Rest Geste, his uh, political autobiography, uh, the, decisive, the decisive year was uh, 27 BC. At the Senate session on January 13th, Caesar's son declared solemnly that he wanted to return all his power to the Senate. He proclaimed the restoration of the Republic and announced that he wanted to retire to private life. The Senate responded in turn by begging him to assume all the powers and giving him the name of Augustus which really uh, literally meant the, the in answer. And uh, Octavian agreed to it uh, whimsically. It was a scene perfectly recited by both sides. And it showed that the conservative and Republican obstruction was over. Even proud senators preferred a master to chaos. Augustus, uh, is a, a fateful word, an exceptional idea. The title of Augustus, uh, worthy of veneration, had no real effects, but uh, was, only, was not only a symbolic homage, as uh, it had a, an almost sacred value. Octavian, although formerly a magistrate like the others, was put on a level of higher authority, the title of Augustus became an integral part of Octavian's name. So now he was uh, Caius, Julius, Caesar, Octavian, Octavianus, Augustus. From which, uh, and this title of Augustus, it passed uh, from uh, two other future uh, emperors. But Augustus' title was only a step in the construction of absolute power. Uh, almost complying formally with the law. Augustus uh, um, Octavian became also Princeps Senatus, Prince of the Senate, the first, once again a subtle masking of reality. Thanks to this perfectly legal position, Octavian was uh, always the first to cast his vote, influencing the vote of all other senators. The term, which had no legal value, princeps senatus, suggested that the Augustus princeps was only the most authoritative of the citizens of a republic, uh, which was only officially still alive. Not just the lord of a mass of subjects without rights, as it was in reality. Octavian himself uh, states that uh, from that moment, that is from the from 27, he had uh, potestas. We can translate uh, uh, a little inaccurately, uh, power, equal to all those who were his colleagues in each uh, judiciary office. But uh, he acknowledges, uh, however, that he had a superior auctoritas, a prestige that derived from uh, his exceptional merits from having extinguished the civil wars and saved the Republic. In other words, he acknowledged that uh, he had only a charismatic superiority, a very skilled statement to which uh, countless essays uh, have been dedicated by historians. And here we come to uh, a monument that you can see in Rome. Uh, to celebrate the peace and concord he brought to the state, um, 
Octavian Augustus even invented a deity, peace, and uh, dedicated to her a temple, which was also a self-celebration of his role as a peacemaker and a defender of the faith. It is the Ara Pacis, the altar of peace, which uh, we can still admire today on the banks of the river Tivere, next to the mausoleum of Augustus, which has been open again uh, in, uh, in the last few days. Uh, Arapaches was built between 13 and 9 BC, and it was originally placed uh, right in Campo Marzio, the area traditionally dedicated to the god of war, where the rites propitious for military campaigns were celebrated. The monument consists of an almost square marble uh, enclosure surrounding a monumental altar accessible through some steps, you can see them here, and is decorated with the plastic reliefs. In the enclosure, there are two entrances which allow you to enter, turn around the altar, and exit from the opposite side. Augustus' political and cultural message is carved on the outer, upper band here of the monument. Here are uh, a dedicatory procession and two scenes uh, that uh, refer to the foundation of Rome. Uh, Romulus and Remus, uh, uh, best fed by the she-wolf, Enea sacrificing to the gods. And two allegorical representations, the goddess Rome sitting above a pile, a pile of weapons and the goddess Tellus holding the twins flanked by the personification of air and uh, water. The characteristics attributed to the goddess Tellus, uh, animals and, and fruits, uh, you can see here, okay, indicate the birth of a new golden age for the earth. This relief, therefore, is intended to uh, reinforce the, the idea of happiness associated with fertility and prosperity. The scene of the wolf recalls the origin, the divine origin of the founder, Romulus. Uh, the twins fed by the she-wolf are in fact, according to tradition, children of the god Mars, you remember from the first episode, and uh, the vestal priestess Rhea Silvia. And uh, the, pres the presence of uh, uh, Aeneas is a clear reference to Gens Iulia, the family of uh, Octavian. Uh, Aeneas, like uh, Augustus, is a pious man, respectful of uh, his ancestors, and uh, presents himself as uh, with a veiled head. The allegorical figures of Rome and the Tellus allude to the fate of the empire. Rome founded his, its power on military force, as you can see here. Rome, the goddess, uh, Rome is sitting on shields and cuirasses and, uh, and weapons. Uh, and, uh, but now, the sense of the monument is that uh, it is time to govern with the justice and peace over all other peoples and above the elements of nature. And here we can see the procession. And uh, in the procession, together with the most important priests of uh, the Roman state religion, uh, all members of the imperial family, including women and children, even the acquired members of the family are depicted. The characters could be recognized by the Romans, who saw that uh, portraits in statues and coins. In the lead is uh, Augustus, here. This is the, the complete frieze and I have enlarged two sections of it. So it is here, Augustus, then a, a procession of, uh, of priests, then uh, Marcus Agrippa with his son uh, uh, Caius Caesar, uh, Julia, the daughter of Augustus and wife of Agrippa, uh, Tiberius, Antonia Minor, 
the daughter of Mark Anthony and Octavia, uh, sister of Augustus, followed by um, his son Germanicus here and uh, facing her husband Drusus, brother of uh, Tiberius. The proportions of the draperies are mm, strictly classic, although the way in which the figures are grouped is more naturalistic than the one on the procession on the frieze of the Parthenon in Athens from which the, the one of this altar derives. The Arapaches is, is, uh, is truly the monument that most exemplifies the role that Augustus is building for himself. Father of the fatherland, second founder of Rome, the one who carries out Rome's mission to unify the known world according to the model of Roman civilization. From the Arapaches, an idea spreads throughout the world. Augustus is destined to be welcome about, uh, among the gods, and he and the emperors after him must be venerated as gods. So, for several years, from 31 to 23 BC, Octavian retained power by being repeatedly elected consul. At the same time, he maintained power over numerous provinces and the legions stationed there. But he was aware that it was a, a temporary accommodation. Uh, the solution was uh, found in 23 BC. Augustus ceased to hold the annual office of consul and was given for life, directly, the two powers that uh, would allow him to manage the state, unifying and tying them from the offices connected uh, with them. The first was the tribuni chapodestas, the power of the tribunes. Thanks to it, he had all the powers of the tribunes of the plebs. He could convene the Senate and the People's Assembly, present bills. Above all, he could veto any decision of the state and other magistrates. And he even had the right to force anyone to obey his orders and to punish those who did not comply. So all in all, nothing could be approved without his consent. The second was uh, the proconsular command, with powers greater than the other proconsuls, and uh, with no time limit. By this, uh, Augustus retained the title of emperor, and thus the control of the army. Formerly, the Republic, with uh, its magistrates, the Senate, and the popular assemblies, remained alive, but um, everything was designed in a way that the supreme power was in the hands of an individual, to whom the Senate and the people themselves had formally attributed a series of prerogatives. Senators and members of the senatorial families still occupied the offices of the Republican tradition, questura, pretura, consulate, but these offices were increasingly devoid of real powers because their administration were run by officers nominated directly by the emperor. The popular assemblies were completely deprived of uh, effective power, and though they were not eliminated, they were reduced to formally approving decisions already taken elsewhere. The election of magistrates by the rallies followed the emperor's uh, directions, and only the laws proposed by him could be passed. In foreign policy, Augustus pointed not so much to the mere conquest of new territories to attain military glory or loot, but uh, rather he aimed at uh, stabilizing the conquest uh, of regions uh, already subject to the Romans for a long time to guarantee uh, a more stable rule or bring the frontier forward to coincide with the easily defensible um, natural borders, rivers such as the Rhine or the Danube. And uh, the Alpine valleys was, uh, were con conquered, both south of the Alps, here in uh, the, the Oste Valley, and to the north, the Noricum, here, present-day Carinthia, and uh, uh, in, in Austria, 
and Rezia, the Swiss valleys. Uh, also uh, Pannonia here in the eastern Austria and uh, western Hungary was also conquered. Looking uh, at this map, we can see that the goal was uh, to secure the Danube River as a stable frontier of, uh, of the empire. And uh, here we come to Germania. Uh, to protect the, the Danube uh, border, Augustus ordered to move forward into Germany, to the Elbe River. And uh, thus, uh, the northern boundary of the empire would be on the line drawn by the Elbe uh, Danube rivers. And between uh, 12 and 9 BC, Germany was uh, submitted by Druso, his uh, Augusta, Augustus uh, stepson. It seemed it would become Roman as a peaceful coexistence was beginning between Romans and Germans as it was already happening in, in Gaul. The situation in the region was, uh, was quite peaceful. Romans were already founding new cities there and uh, as they had done elsewhere in, uh, in Europe. Uh, Germans and Romans were beginning to mix up in markets and in fora. But uh, the fire was smoldering under the ashes. In 9 AD, when Roman rule in the region seemed to have uh, stabilized, a revolt of the, Romans, uh, of the Germans broke out, led by the head of, uh, of the tribe of the Cheruscans. He had fought in the Roman army during previous campaigns. He had even obtained uh, Roman citizenship. His full Roman uh, Roman name was uh, uh, Gaius Julius Arminius. Arminius was the mm, son of a Cheruscan chief and presumably an officer in the Roman army. But um, he had plotted against the Roman governor Publius Varus. Varus was informed of the plot but refused to give credit to it and set out to put out down a revolt of which the conspirators had warned him. The Roman army led by Publius Varus recklessly entered the deep forest of uh, Tutburg here, in the middle of Germany. And uh, three legions were totally massacred. The historian Dione Cassius recounts that when Augustus knew what had happened to Varus, he tore his clothes and kept on shouting, Varus, give me my regions back, my legions back. He expected barbarians to march against Italy and against Rome itself, but uh, it did not happen. The Germans of those times did not have any desire to defy the Roman power outside their territories. Varus' defeat marked a turning point in the history of Europe. Germany was never conquered again by the Romans, and the Rhine became the final border between a, a, a Latin Europe and the lands where the German language is still spoken today. The Germanic populations will never be submitted, and will remain over the centuries a constant threat for the Empire until its collapse under the pressure of uh, barbarian invasions. In the East, uh, uh, let's go back to this, uh, to this uh, map here. In the East, Augustus pursued uh, um, a different uh, policy, aiming to gain uh, Roman supremacy through diplomacy. He entered into negotiations with the Parthian king and succeeded in uh, uh, placing a friendly king on the Armenian throne. And, uh, but above all, he obtained the return of the Roman military insignia, which you know uh, are crucial in, uh, in, Roman, uh, in, in the military history of Rome, uh, captured by the Parthians in the wars against uh, Crassus and uh, Anthony. 
Later on, he tried to keep the Parthian Empire and the Armenian Kingdom uh, under control by intervening in the struggles for succession. And, uh, and so Rome obtained the control of several small regions uh, of the East through allied kings, uh, such as uh, Herod of Judea, here, under whose reign Jesus of Nazareth was, was born. These small kings were totally submissive to the Roman will, and Augustus even decided their family policies and their succession. So, Augustus is one of the greatest political myths in the West. However, despite his amazing fortune, the figure of Augustus does not arouse the same emotions, the same passions, the same involvement of uh, Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. Why? Basically, Augustus' life was an extraordinary human and political adventure, but uh, poor in events that can be translated in the forms of uh, literature, theater, cinema. Usually, Augustus' uh, character uh, moves, enters the movies or the books uh, obliquely, either because uh, of the evocative story of Antony and Cleopatra or because of the murder of Caesar after drawing uh, uh, inspiration from Shakespeare. Then the great losers, the unfortunate heroes, appear to us more fascinating than the great winners. There is a lot of charm in the sudden death of uh, Alexander the Great, eliminated at the age of uh, 33 by a sudden fever when uh, he had conquered most of the known world. Or in the assassination of Julius Caesar, pierced by daggers in a conspiracy that uh, hundreds of uh, people in Rome probably knew, but uh, of which he was unaware. In short, the winners who die old in their bed, like Augustus, who died at the age of 77 of the more than 40 years of reign, do not have the same charm and success. Well, notwithstanding this, the age of Augustus is certainly one of the happiest times in Roman history. Thanks to his shrewd choices, his incredible ability to choose the times of political action, and to gather consensus around his figure. Caesar's life and death may be more intriguing, more dramatic, but um, Caesar did not survive his creature. Octavian did, and made it stronger and more alive. Thanks to him, Rome will be the beacon of the Western world for another 400 years, and its influence will extend well beyond the end of his empire. Okay, that's uh, all for today. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I was able to entertain you with uh, uh, this uh, story. And uh, next time we will talk about uh, the age of Augustus, what happened during his age, the, the, the realizations uh, also. We will, I will uh, lead you, take you to, to the Pantheon in, uh, in Rome or to um, Oh, to the to, to the, the fora, uh, uh, the imperial fora, uh, still in Rome, and in, in two weeks. So I hope to uh, see you again online in two weeks. Thank you very much for your attention, and please follow us on Facebook and uh, on www.vito.com. We'll have more uh, episodes uh, of uh, our podcast uh, in, in a few days. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Ciao da Marcello and Vitor.